all the time, God. Amen. All the time, God is good. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to welcome you that are watching tonight, you that have joined us, and we do count it such an honor, a privilege to be able to bring the Word of God to you and to be able to stand on the, the valuable truths of His Word, amen, and understanding that the time that we live in, amen, and, and looking around us and seeing what has happened, it is so important that we keep preaching the valuable truth. It is so important that today as we begin to move forward that we understand this right here. For every evil statement, it has to, amen, understand that there is a true statement that will come in conflict with it. That we're going to see that the minds of evil are going to be challenged. That Lord, that and during this time, the Lord will not allow their voices, will not allow their statements to go idle. But will bring forth the word which will not return to him void, but will accomplish all that he said to do. Once again, we're talking about prayer. We're talking about effective communication with our Lord Jesus Christ. We understand this right here. The Bible says we're to uh, study to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So as we share in this moment right here, I ask that your hearts be open. That your mind be receptive. I ask that in this time right here, that as we begin to rise up with the, the value that has been given to us in the word of God. The truthful statements that Jesus himself even stood upon. That this will be a conversation that you can share around the office, you can share it at home. That you can share the value of truth. And so when all of a sudden the naysayers say, well, you know some, I just don't believe that that, uh, that uh, baby in the womb of a mother is really a baby. That you're going to know how to be able to come back with the value of truth. And you're going to use Jeremiah where God told Jeremiah. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And not only did I know you, I formed you, I created you, and I made you a prophet to the nation. And so I want to say tonight, as we begin to enter into prayer, at the time of prayer, knowing what to pray for, how to pray for it, and then how to become active in your prayer life. Because many times our prayers are so insensitive that we find out many times prayers are more of greed than they are of need. Oh God, I need. Oh God, I need. Oh God, help me. Oh God. No, let's, let's get into where we say, God, we want to pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a very hard prayer to pray. You see, when Jesus went to Gethsemane, he was ready. He was ready. But the thing of it is, his flesh was fighting him. It was a time where his blood pressure went so high, it says to his, his blood, it came forth as great uh, uh, drops of, uh, just like sweat, it, it, it began to come forth, and, and, and he, his blood pressure, I'm sure, was, was just off the chart. But he prayed, and he prayed to his father, and he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Yes. Then he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And he prayed again and again. Three times he prayed. But you know, after every prayer, he went out to see what the disciples were doing. And they were asleep. He woke them up, went back in and prayed. Came back out. They were asleep. He went back in and prayed the last time. And then when he came out, he told his disciples, sleep on. Sleep on. What he said was, I've already committed myself to the will of the Father. I will go to Calvary. Yes, I'll take that beating, that crown of thorns. Yes, I will take those nails in my hand and my feet. Yes, I'm going to even go to that. I'm going to go to that grave. I've already accepted what the Father has in store for me. And so, as we are looking at the Word of God tonight, we ask ourselves this question: Have we accepted our God-given purpose, our mission? Have we accepted? That which we've been created for, it's hard. It is really hard. Because right now, we have to stand against the naysayers. We have to stand against the liars. We have to come against those that desire to take and overturn the word of God. Yes, we have leaders today that literally mock the Bible. We have leaders today in this nation right here that they have become so evil that death is a celebration 
but it's the death of others. Yeah. And they have no feelings. They have no conscience. For I believe this right here. I believe that they have sold their soul to the devil himself. You say, how do you, how do you, uh, what makes you believe that? I'll tell you what makes me believe that. Because they've lost any desire whatsoever for honesty, for truth, for the value of family and life. They've lost value for gender. They've, they want to turn everything yeah. completely upside down and bring in the demonic evil ways of the devil himself. But I want to share with you that we're not going to give up, let up, slow up, back up, because we know that one day we're getting ready to go up. And when we get ready to go up, we want to hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to take you to St. Matthew chapter 18. In St. Matthew, we're going to be looking at the Word of God right here. And in verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, that whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Before I go to verse 19, listen to this right here. Jesus said this right here. These are the red letters. He said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What do we bind in church? What do we bind in here on earth? Because we know this right here. Whatever we bind according to the word of God. It's going to be bound in heaven. And that means we have to pray the effective will of God. So we begin to bind what we're seeing that's coming forth right now. Over the television that's coming forth over the news reports. That is trying to pervert the minds of each and every one that is here in this nation. We look around today and we ask this right here. Can we bind right now? Can we bind abortion? You say, why do you keep preaching on that? Because, understand this right here, 63 to 65 million babies, blood cries out. 63 to 65 million. Think about that. That is probably a fourth of the population of this, of, of this nation. If we took the, the five most uh, populated cities, it would be no one left in them if we were to use that as population. Think about that. So when we begin to bind this, we say, oh God, we're going to bind right now the purpose of going forth and destroying a life. Purposely. Yes. It means premeditated. It means that right now today, as we begin to look in America today, over $1 billion of taxpayer money is going to abortion. Think about that. Think about when we look at this right here. A government that will take your money. I'm talking Christians. And will apply it to abortion centers. And the fact of it is now our government is even saying that, listen, they want to give a tax credit if you have an abortion. So you need to Google this. You need to look it up. And ask yourself this question right here. Why... Am I responsible for abortion? Why am I? Also, we begin to look at, amen, gender. We look at today that if you say that there's only male and female, you are one of the most evil, you are, most, you are one of the most uneducated people on the planet. But understand this right here. That when God made man... And God made woman. He always said it is good. There's never been any change. There's been doctors that have said this right here. They have said that there is a mental illness. That takes place when a young man desires to be changed into a female. There's a mental illness that takes place when a female desires to become a male. But we know this right here. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many surgeries you have, you cannot change your DNA. The blood will always speak the truth. Yes. So as we begin to bind right now, the deception that the enemy is throwing out there that yes, even school children, as small as seven years old, the school says that we can take them that we can begin to push their, 
their gender into where they want it to be. A young boy comes to school and he says, my name is Sue or my name is whatever. And the teacher says, we begin to build on that. Instead of saying, I believe that we need to educate you as far as gender. A lot of this we find out is because that there is not a male in the home. When there's a father in the home, and I say this from experience, he teaches his young boys how to be gentlemen. He teaches his girls how to conduct themselves. And he, he will make sure that in this right here that the, that the mother and father in the home bring up their children, amen, to understand the value of life and truth. I remember even with mine. I would take my sons and we would go out hunting. First time we went out there and my son shot a squirrel, he was elated. You say, oh, that's not, no, he was learning how to survive. It was a survival training. He learned how to take and skin it. He learned how that we could get it ready. And then not only that, his mama showed him how that uh, we were gonna cook it up and how that we were gonna uh, fix the squirrels. We had rabbits and everything else and, and the boys were just elated because you know what? This was survival, this is what boys do and, and they, really, they really felt that, that coming into manhood. With my daughters, I always taught them how to be proper, how, listen, when you go out, amen, you want to go out, but make sure in this right here that a young man knows that you have a perimeter around you. Yes. Because they want to violate you, many of them, or touch you. I remember in this right here, the first time that our oldest daughter came in and she was getting ready to go on a date, sweet 16. Wow. And her boyfriend had to come meet me. And people... They go, well, you know, they don't do that anymore. They just meet him down the block, jump in the car and take off. No. He came to meet me. I was sitting there cleaning my shotgun. And I told him, I said, if you touch my daughter, I said, this gun has a purpose. And I said, I have rock salt. And you will know what the burn feels like. My daughter looked at me and she was just like, oh, dad. They came home. I told him to be home at 10 o'clock, wasn't it? 10 o'clock. 9 o'clock, he got her home. She came in the house and she said, I said, you're home early. She said, this was, we, this was the most boring time in my life. She said, he wouldn't even hold my hand. He wouldn't even touch my hand. I said, job well done. We laughed about it. But I wanted her to know that she was so valuable. That, listen, he had no right to violate her. That's the way they were raised. But today we find out that through the news media, we find out today in school and everything else, that through their sex education, that even in, the, even in kindergarten and in first grade up to third grade, they were, they're teaching them things that many of us, and I know older, we didn't even know when we probably got up to junior high or high school. But now, they're wanting to teach them this. Why? Because the teacher himself is a homosexual. Why would a homosexual want to teach preschool children or first graders, want to teach them why or how the him and his male lover have such a wonderful affair? We look at this and we go, so perverted. Why, why are you grooming these children? Because if you were to get in to statistics, you would find out that most male homosexuals are predators. They're out for young boys. And if we can groom them, if we can get their minds our way, they're much easier to become a victim. So when we begin to look at this right here, in the church, what happened? We stopped teaching. In the, in the church, we stopped, amen, exposing what the enemy's doing. 
We got into the feel-good message. We got into bless me and bless me and bless me. And we forgot, amen, how to get into bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. That's by, amen, speaking the value of truth with the content of the word that backs it up. So Jesus said this right here. He said, listen, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That means what I'm talking about, we start binding it right now. We start coming against it right now. We see today that we're, and, and, and we look at criminals today. Isn't it something that right now, a criminal can go up before a judge or district attorney, go up for murder, and then be released on a misdemeanor yep. and put right back out on the street. Isn't it something we look around, we begin to see that evil promotes evil. Yes, there's been ones that reoffend, And someone said, well, how, how can they do this? It's because there was no punishment. There was no judgment for their crime. And so I've always said this right here. That listen, if there is no judgment on crime and they don't have to do any time, they're right back out thinking I can do the same thing again. Yeah. So what we do is we start binding. We start binding the minds of these judges. These district attorneys. We bind that they shall not be able to be in office. They are voted in and they can be voted out. And so we have to understand this right here. We have an obligation. How do you bind something? It means this right here. First of all, that you have to have that, amen, in your possession which you bind. What are you saying? It means when I begin to pray, I have to have a name. It means I have to have a situation. It means in this right here that I am very specific, amen, in my prayer and what I'm binding. And that's how that we do that. And so we talk about this right here. So when we begin to look at the Word of God, He says, whatever you loosen, I loosen the Word of God. I loosen the value of truth. I loosen that there is but two genders, male and female. I loosen in this right here that, that that baby in the womb of a mother is not a blob. It's just not a bunch of cells that, amen, they've been brought together. It is a living, breathing child. I loosen that fact right there. And so as we begin to loosen, I loosen right now. Everyone has been held in bondage by the enemy. I begin to loosen them in the name of Jesus. I loosen our young ladies, amen. Uh, we, have, we have young women today that have been molested, that have been raped, that have gone through so many horrible situations. But understand this right here. What I have to do, amen, is first of all, I want to bind the evil mind of these predators, of these that have committed such crimes, amen, against these, not only women, but also against some of these boys, the sexual sin. I bind it in the name of Jesus. But also I loosen the peace that passes all understanding. I loosen his grace and his mercy that they will understand that through all of this right here that they can have a new day. That in all this they can use it for the glory of God. I love what one of the, uh, amen, one of the uh, candidates said is running for office. Uh, I was listening to her and, and she said this right here. She said, my mama was raped at 11 years old. And she said she became pregnant with me. The man that raped her was 21 years old. And she said, my mother said, I will not make the child pay for the crime. And she said, you, 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 you would not believe the people that say, you, need to, you just need to go ahead and, and, and kill the baby. Have an abortion, get rid of the baby. No. Because she said, you know what? Even at 11 years old, my mama knew the Bible. And she took me to full term. She said, I'm standing here today. She said, I could have been one. I could have been one that went, they took me right down, took my mama right down there to the, you know, to the facility. And, and I ended up in a trash can or a garbage disposal or whatever. But she said, listen, I said, I'm the one that survived because of my mother. And so she said, listen, in all this right here, she said, what we have to do is understand that now I can be the one 
that can help others. I can help a young girl that has been raped. And I can show her what God has done for me. I can show her that there is life. That there is purpose. And so with this right here, there's no telling how many lives that she can affect. How is she going to affect these lives? She's going to affect them by giving them the truth, the value of God's word. And she's going to let them know that through all this right here, that you know what? God took what the enemy meant for evil and turned it in to his glory. So when we pray, we begin to pray over this nation. We have seen that the statistics say that there are so many rape cases in this nation that it's not even calculated. It's not even kept up with. Not even many of them not even reported. Because it's just so many. What do they tell them? Well, you know what? You have the right to dispose of the problem. We can, we can correct the problem. That's what they said. We can correct the problem. But understand this right here. God can use each and every one of these. And so James Robertson, he was one that his mama was raped. And she carried him to full term. And why? Because she knew that God could use this for his glory. Here's a man that has preached all over the world. Here's a man right here that has gone to other nations and he's helped in Africa and digging wells and, and showing the love of Jesus Christ. Here's one that said, I could, she could have disposed of me. I could have, I could have ended up in a, a garbage disposal, a dump or wherever. But you know what? She knew that life in the hands of God can be perfect. So the reason I'm sharing this is we have to bind that evil spirit of death and destruction. We have to bind that, that spirit that wants to literally destroy the future of this nation. What is a nation with no population? We look at China. And how many here remember in China they were told you can have one child? If you have one child and it's a male, that's good. If you have a child but it's a female, they would literally come into the home and they would take the life of that young, that young female baby. Because they said we're so overpopulated that we must kill the female and let the male live. Well, they said that it came a time that there were not going to be enough women for the men. The young men want to choose a wife. Well, there'd be seven, seven men to every one woman. How, how does that work out for you? We see that evil makes plans, but it does not look ahead and see what the consequences are. Where's this nation at today? They said our population is less today. It is dwindling. Why is that? They said, number one, they said families right now are maybe two children. In fact, if it is a lot of the marriages that are taking place today, they have said that they value their business, they value their future more than a child. A child will be in the way. It will be a hindrance. And so they put it off having children. And so when we look at this right here, we, we understand what the Bible says. The Bible says, happy is the man whose quiver is full of arrows. Talking about children. And so I remember growing up, I told my wife about this. We had a family that lived up next to us. They were a Catholic family. And so we know that, that with the Catholic family, that they said, listen, nothing, nothing can be used, amen, to take a, away from, you know, reproduction, nothing. Anything's abortion that is used to prevent having children. They had 15, 16 children. I said, my Lord. They had their own football team. They had their own basketball team. I mean, they had children in every window and everything. Just And so I asked my dad about that, and this is what he said. He said, understand this right here. The repopulation of another generation, it comes through your children. And he said, if the replacement does not exceed those that have passed, he said, then understand this right here. Your nation is diminishing. And so that's where we're at today. We're seeing that. And so as we look in the Word of God, we ask, what are we binding? What are we loosening? What is it that we're praying? How, how specific is our prayer? 
Once again, we get into many times prayer, and, and, and I'm saying this in churches, and we want to build We want to build a, a church. We want more people in the church. We want to fill all the pews, and we want more offering. We want this right here. But listen, pray the will of God. Pray that lost souls will come. Pray that we're going to be able to see, amen, ones that are coming in that are bound by drugs, ones that are coming in that are bound by, uh, they're bound by alcohol, ones that are coming in that are homeless, and they, they, they've, made, they've made the wrong decisions in their life, but that we can share with them the value of the truth of God's word and help them out of the pits of failure, that we can see them come out of the ditches of despair. How, how are we going to do that? By praying them in. Well, you know, hey, you pray, you start praying the homeless, and it's like, look, look, we didn't pray for all that. I had someone tell me one time, I said, church is an emergency room, a spiritual emergency room. And I said, when they come in, they come in devastated. They come in because they've been under the heavy hand of the enemy so long. And then when they come to the house of God, what do they meet? What do they see? I'm sorry, but you don't belong here. You don't look at you. You deserve what you're getting. You know, in church, we want to say we accept everybody. But, I, you know, I, I've seen so much that we don't accept. And why is that? Because you can't minister to somebody that's sitting in the pew back there that is still half drunk, half high on, on drugs. Oh, yes, we can. Because the Holy Spirit can go past that. Yeah. Holy Spirit can begin to get into that spiritual place and begin, amen, to wake up their conscience to where all of a sudden they begin to receive the value of the Word of God. And it can take them into the place that the truth is going to penetrate. Right. And so I've said this. We've all been there. We've all been to that place, amen, that we did not serve God. We did not want God. We weren't trusting God. We were out for ourselves. But then the Holy Spirit, through somebody, began yeah. to get to us and began to show us, amen, that, listen, life without God is death in progress. Yes. Yeah. Life without God. Is death in progress. Amen. And so Jesus goes on and he says right here in verse 19. St. Matthew chapter 18 now verse 19. Again, he's going to reiterate this. I say unto you that he said, If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. If two. Believers come together and say, before we pray. Now, if somebody comes up and says, I want you to pray with me. I want to know what we're praying about. Because you may be praying against the will of God. Yep. Yep. So you ask, what are we praying about? Because I can't agree with you touching this matter unless I know it lines up with the word of God. Amen. Because if it's not his will, he's not going to do it. And so, but he said, if you and another believer come together and you join hands, this is a connection, amen, and you join hands and you begin to pray in agreement, you begin to pray the will of God outlined in his word, amen, and this is what he said. He said, listen, my father's going to give it to you because it's his will. His promises are yea and amen. He's going to do it. But you've got to know the purpose of your prayer. And many times we don't stop and think about that. That's the reason that I've had times that I want to pray and I'm saying, I really don't know how to pray for this. Because I want to understand the purpose of it. I want to understand, number one, is this going to glorify God? I want to, I want to understand in this right here. Is this something that is of my flesh or is this something that the Holy Spirit is really prompting me, amen, to pray? And it may be a really, really hard prayer. And I say, help me, Lord, because I've got to say thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. And so... Here we see Jesus saying, well, listen, 
Find you somebody that's in his will. Find you somebody that knows the word. And then discuss what you're going to pray about. Amen. And then join hands and pray. Because I've, I've had this happen in my young ministry, you know. And, and someone come up and say, I just want you to pray with me and agree with me. Okay, we start praying. I'm like, whoa. Whoa. I can't, I, I, I can't agree with that. And they get really upset. Well, you can't agree with me. It doesn't line up with the word of God. Amen. And this right here, it, it doesn't glorify him. I really can't, I, I really just can't agree with that. So it's better to know ahead of time what you are agreeing with than have to come back and say, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, sh I should not have agreed with them. Because how many know that when you agree with somebody, you cut covenant with somebody? Yes. And that becomes very dangerous. So prayer is so powerful. It's not something that we just grab and throw up. It's not. It's something that we have to have a purpose for it and understand that purpose. Amen. And then find somebody else to agree with us. Amen. As the purpose is now being sent for permission. And once God grants it, then we begin to see it. That's the reason I've said it. You can't just, you know, you can't just throw some prayer out there. There are many today that are praying a prayer, and I'll use this right here, just saying, oh God, right now, just all these doctors out here that are doing abortion, just kill them all. That goes, did you really think about that? No. God, I need somebody to agree with me that we're going to pray every doctor, every nurse gets saved. We're going to pray the salvation the blood of Jesus Christ yeah. that they will accept and it'll turn them around because we've seen this happen where doctors and nurses that, that were performing these abortions that they got saved and, and everything and now when they stand they're standing as men and women of God and they're speaking forth the value of truth amen and so I said this never pray death on somebody just because you don't like them Always pray for salvation. Pray that they'll get saved. Amen? Because many times in church, we're guilty of that. Oh, just smite them. Smite them down. No. Save them, Lord. Save them. Because they can be a key to lead many into the values of truth. Amen? So Jesus goes on and he says, now that we, we, we've started binding, we started loosening according to the will of our Father, and then we found somebody that we can touch, amen, because touching is connection. When you grab hands with somebody, you're connecting with them. What you're doing, amen, is you're coming together with your faith, and you're connecting, and, and you're sending this prayer up before the Father. And, and, and I want to tell you something. There is power in prayer when believers connect one with another. Yeah. When you begin to join hands on Sunday morning, when we have prayer and we join hands and we're having prayer, there's power in that. Amen. It, 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 it feels like a surge, amen, of spiritual power as we're lifting up, amen, our voice before God. So we look at this. He goes on, he says in verse 20 right here. He says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He said his divine presence, his permission, his strength, his will, his power. When you're praying, you absent yourself from the fleshly mind. When you're praying and the Holy Spirit begins to move, how many know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, in the midst of this right here, you you start praying. You go, where did this come from? Where did I, I'm just praying the will of my Father. I'm praying right now, but this is no longer me. It's no longer about me. This is all about the kingdom of heaven, amen? And so I begin to pray, or God may show me somebody. And in the midst of this right here, I begin to pray for somebody, even in the ministry right here. I can see where they're sitting. I see what they're going through. And I begin to pray for them and lift them up. Our daughter had texted us earlier and 
and one of the uh, one of the ladies that she does home health for, uh, she had she had a uh, heart attack. She's right now in the hospital and congestive heart failure. But listen, her husband got hold of our daughter and said, "Have have them pray for her. Have them please start praying for her, because he knows." And, and Sean just told him, "We're a praying church." That we can lift, we lift them up and we pray for them. And so I just share this as we're praying for. I'll call her name Sister Mary. As we're praying for her right now, that she's laying in that hospital bed, we're praying the power of healing that's provided through, Amen, the blood and stripes of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we're praying in the midst of this right here, that his will be done. Now, this is hard when I say his will be done because sometimes we're praying that God's going to rebuild that heart. God is just going to do all this. But what we have to say is this right here. According to your word, your will be done. Amen. Well, you mean tell me she, she could pass? Yeah. If that's his will. You tell me that she could be healed and go home tomorrow if that's his will. But understand this right here. Knowing the will or the purpose of the prayer makes it, amen, to where we can accept the outcome. That's hard. I prayed for ones. They died. I prayed for ones and they lived. I prayed for young babies. And they passed away. I prayed for young babies and they lived. But I learned this right here. That I had to pray the will of our Father who's in heaven. Because I didn't know. I said if, if we knew the will of God as far as for that child, it could be somewhere down the line that some, some horrific uh, incident could have taken place. We don't know. But God could have said, you know what? Come on, I'm going to bring you on home. And so I begin to bind the fleshly mind of man. I begin to say, could somebody please help me? Bind up, amen, that fleshly mind that we want to tell God what to do when we pray. But what we want to do is release in the spirit the will of our Father be done. And it's hard to do. But he said, if you join with somebody... In agreement. He said, I'll be right there in the midst. He said, I'm going to have my divine presence there. And he said, you're going to know. You're going to know what to pray for. And so that's where we're at right now. You see, we have a problem. And I get in trouble over this, but, I, you know, I'm one of these, I don't care. Hot water feels good. I said, how can... How can we in a nation say that we're a godly nation when three churches can't even talk to each other? <laughs> How can we say that we are, amen, that we love our brothers and sisters and we talk about uh, every denomination? And, and, and I said, listen, there's so much division in the body of Christ. We can't even pray together. We can't even get the pastors to all come together, amen, in agreement to pray over the city. No. Because you know what? Somebody's got to be the head cheese. Somebody's got to be the biggest one. Somebody's got to be the most important one. And, and so uh, understand this right here. Unless you're just well known, you know, get to the back of the line. I've been through that. Oh, you're just a young preacher. Just going back there. Okay, I got you. I went on back there. I went all the way out the door. But listen to this right here. I pray for unity in the body of Christ. But unity has to start in every local body. Yes. It means that we're not any better than anybody else. Oh, you Pentecostals think you're better than everybody else. And all oh, you Baptists think that you're the only way. And Church of Christ, oh, listen, you got to... Listen, 
Why can't we get to the point we agree, amen, that salvation is only through Jesus Christ, amen, and stop condemning each other and trying to destroy each other, amen, and just build up our own local church? Yes. I was listening to one of the pastors just before I came in here, and he was making a statement. And that's what he said. Every church in America has dwindled. Every church in America is now to the point of surviving. Not thriving, surviving. If you were to look at Germany and look at some of their big cathedral churches, they're empty. They're a tourist attraction is all they are. You know why? Because during the war, during the battle, so many left and would never go back. Yeah. America has now come to the place where so many have left the church. They went into seclusion. COVID-19 has literally been one of the strongest enemies that has attacked the world. Not, not just America, I'm talking about the world. Yes. Everywhere you go, businesses are closed. Everywhere you go, you see signs, help wanted. Man, you look around, devastation everywhere. It started with control. And one man, said, I can control the world if you'll let me. And he did. He literally brought the world under the, I'll say the fist of his hand. And now that we're trying to come back to some kind of normalcy, people don't know how. I saw an individual the other day in his vehicle, all by himself, got all masked up and everything else. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? But he's under control. I walk into the stores. I see people wearing masks that are under their nose right here because it fogs up your glasses. So they wear the mask down here, but a mask I'm protected. See, it's a mental. It's a mental control. As long as I feel that I'm protected, I'm happy. I said, my Lord, such miserable people. I went up to the VA before I even started through the door. You better have a mask on. I got a mask that, Lord knows how old it is. Won't he have to stay on my face is hanging down. And they said, it's okay, as long as you got something over your face. I thought, my Lord, it's nothing more than a mental control. And I thought, isn't it something? The enemy rejoicing, because you know if you have a mask on, you can't tell if somebody's smiling. I go in the store and of course, the only time I wear a mask when I go to VA, you know, render Caesar what Caesar. But other than that, I go in the store. I want somebody to laugh. I want somebody to smile. I want somebody, amen, to come out of that miserable attitude that they have. How do we do that? Get prayed up before you go and say, Father, I know what your will is. Your will is that I go forth and that I imitate your son, my Savior, Jesus Christ, as Paul said, listen, I want you to be an example, just like I am, but be an example of Jesus Christ. And so prayer is powerful. If you don't know how to pray, get in the Word of God. One of the you know, one of the scriptures I love reading about prayer is every time that Jesus prayed, 
It says he went and got alone. And he prayed to his father. It says that, you know what? When he was tired, he prayed. Before every conflict, he prayed. Don't you know if Jesus needs to pray, how much more we need to pray? Pray over your situation. But pray that you know the purpose. Pray that with this right here, the outcome is not up to you. The outcome is up to our Father in heaven. Yes. That's the reason Jesus said at Gethsemane. He said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Bow your head with me. Father, we pray that as we come together tonight, we agree that, Lord God, prayer has to line up with your word. We know that the effective fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. That means right standing, right direction. That means that we know the right purpose. It means in this right here that when we call upon the name of the Lord, that we know that, Lord God, your ears are open unto our cry. Your eyes are open unto our situation. And, Lord God, that you've already got a plan, a solution. And then, Lord God, we have to learn how to accept it. That, Lord God, there's many times the answer is going to be no. There's many times it will be yes. But we have to know that the purpose, Lord God, of our prayer, once it is delivered, Lord God, will be accepted, not by feelings, but by faith. I pray that tonight, Lord God, for those that are watching right now, I pray for those that are sick in body, that, Lord God, that in the midst of this right here, when they pray, that they pray and say, Lord God, that I want you to heal my body so that I can serve you more. I want you to heal my body that I can be able to do more for the kingdom. I want you to heal my body that I can help a brother or sister that is in need. I want, Lord God, in the midst of this right here, that my days be prolonged because I've got such a God-given purpose and I do not want my days to be short and that I will not complete the purpose that was given at my birth when you begin to pray the will of God and then you begin to show him just like Hezekiah when he was told that he was going to die Hezekiah get your house in order you're going to die but it said he turned his face to the wall and he began to pray out to God he said oh God I've tore down them idols he said I've tore down them altars and he began to tell God, he said, I've done all this right here, but there's so much more that I need to do. And God told the prophet, go back and tell him that he shall live. He's going to live for another 15 years. I pray that, Lord God, tonight, that be our prayer. That the reason we want to live is to worship you, to serve you, Lord God, and that we can touch a life that is bound for hell and see them turn around and, Lord God, one day step through the gates of glory. Now, tonight, Lord God, we lift up America. We lift up this nation that has gone so perverted. We lift up a nation that is so divided. We lift up a nation right now that, Lord God, that they call evil good and good evil. We live in a nation today, Lord God, that has no sensitivity over life. They believe that death should be celebrated. We, we live in a nation today, Lord God, where many, if they don't get their way, they take to the streets and we begin to see threatening. We, we see lives that are lost. We see, Lord God, destruction of property. It's all because evil demands that they be right. But tonight, Lord God, we pray that in this nation we'll wake up. And then, Lord God, we'll come back to the altar of truth. And we will stand and say, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we in America choose Jesus Christ as Lord. Now we give you glory and praise for it's in the name of Jesus Christ that everyone said amen and amen. Give God glory tonight. We thank God for each and every one of you. Amen. Pray for Sister Alex and she'll be on her way home tomorrow. Amen. And also, as I said, be praying over the family for uh, Sister Mary that is uh, in the hospital with congestive heart failure and uh, just believing, amen, that God's will is going to be done. And uh, amen, if it's his will that she be healed and come home, amen, we're going to accept that. Uh, but like I said, we pray right now for the family 
uh, and uh, you know what they're going through, the pain of this and the husband, we would pray for him God give him the strength and give him Lord, the ability to be able to accept God's outcome in this right here so God bless you, pray for one another, amen, that we will be strengthened in the name of Jesus